The Communion of Saints is a series that seeks to share information on the life and times of the saints of the Catholic Church. Your program hosts are Father Jim Corda and Father Jack Lavelle. Hello and welcome to this edition of Communion of Saints. I'm Father Jim Corda. And I'm Father Jack Lavelle. Now today we're going to focus on three feast days of the Blessed Mother. Uh, in this first segment, we're going to talk about uh, her Immaculate Conception. Then the second, we're gonna focus on Our Lady of Guadalupe. And then the final one, we'll talk about uh, her Assumption. So let's talk a little bit uh, about Mary herself, even before we get into the Feast of the Immaculate Conception. Uh, we know her as the angel said, full of grace. Now, when the angel said full of grace, doesn't that give a hint of what the feast we celebrate that we're going to talk about now, the Immaculate Conception? Oh, absolutely. And, and you know, theologians have debated for years and years uh, the role of Mary. Uh, I think to even go back a little further, uh, what oftentimes confuses many people about the role of Mary, the role of the Blessed Mother, is that most of what we as a Catholic people hold true is out of tradition, uh, more so than scripture. Um, you voice that, that scriptural reference from the Annunciation, um, and it certainly gives us an understanding of who Mary was, who Mary is, and who Mary will always be for us. But there's very little in scripture. Most of the feasts that we celebrate, most of um, what we've come to know about Mary is by piecing together who she was in relationship with Jesus and who she had to have been um, to be in the role that she was in. And so we certainly see in the Immaculate Conception that fullness of grace from the very beginning, mm -hmm. um, going back to um, her parents coming together and creating her out of love. And it's interesting because when we talk about the Immaculate Conception, oftentimes uh, Catholics uh, got confused and thought that they were talking about Jesus. But mm -hmm. it's really Mary herself that was born without original sin. And, and so uh, even though her birth was brought about through normal human means, there's still this sense that, that when her soul was part of her body, that she herself was free from not only original sin, but personal sin. Mm -hmm. and, and when we say that someone's free from personal sin, obviously we, we say that that person is immaculate, to use the term that we, we use for Mary. But we also use different words like, like pure, chaste. Um, so her whole life was really caught up in, in celebrating God's presence within her. but. But was she aware of that? I think that's a question that many people would ask. Uh, was Mary, like Jesus, aware of the special role that she had? Mm -hmm. I'm sure that as her life went on and as the ministry of Jesus went on and she was part of that, that she saw her role as certainly uh, not only the mother of Jesus, but the mother of God. Well, we have no uh, historical documentation that there was any um, announcement or pronouncement made to Anna and Joachim. Um, the first pronouncement would have been, again, Gabriel appearing to Mary uh, when scholars say she was somewhere between the age of 13, 14, 15 years old. Um, what that says to us is that although Mary was given this role from the very beginning in her Immaculate Conception, she also was given that gift of free will. And I think that is coupled with her Immaculate Conception so important because what that tells us is Mary in her free will chose even throughout her early life to be a good, faithful, loving, devout young Jewish girl, um, obedient to her parents, obedient to the temple, obedient to the scriptures. Um, and certainly that is what the Lord was looking for in the mother of his son. Not someone who was forced into a role, but who was prepared for the role if it be her will. And we see that in those first 13, 14 years, that was her will. She didn't know what was going to happen, but she cooperated with God's plan. And through that free will and through her own faith, um, brought about the events of that greeting with Gabriel and then all of the other days with Christ. See, what comes to mind when you were talking mm -hmm. was that, that Latin word fiat, let it be. 
And so, you know, Mary's whole life was caught up in letting God be God in her life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, oftentimes uh, scholars had said that uh, some of the greatest miracles uh, were, was not really that uh, Mary was um, uh, immaculate, immaculately conceived or that the Jesus uh, had a virgin birth, but the greatest miracle was that Mary believed that through God's word, this would come about. And so she is the vehicle and the great miracle that brought about um, eternal salvation for all of us. Let's get a little more specific about the feast itself. Uh, we know that we celebrate that as Catholics on December 8th. It was uh, promulgated by Pope Pius IX in uh, 1854 in the document. Uh, in English, we call the ineffable God. And mm -hmm. you know, that word ineffable really defines God himself because uh, even though we cannot define God, it tells us how we cannot fully understand him using the words like uh, inexhaustible or incomprehensible. Mm -hmm. So this whole feast of the Immaculate Conception really is uh, incomprehensible when we think about it. And when we think about uh, God working through humankind um, and Mary's role in all of that. Uh, in your experience, and I know your first pastor was uh, it, a church called Immaculate Conception. And there's many churches, not only in our diocese, but throughout the country and throughout the world where uh, churches are celebrated with that term Immaculate Conception. Uh, in closing, in the last few minutes that we have together, what would be your experience in uh, naming a church after Mary's Immaculate Conception? Well, kind of twofold. It's perhaps, uh, to use the phrase, unfortunate uh, that the feast falls when it does. Um, we know that December 8th is the natural pro, uh, you know, procession from having been conceived and then being born. We celebrate the birth of Mary on September 8th, and so we go back nine months. Um, liturgically, it does at times get lost in the Advent season and then in the preparation for Christmas. Um, because of Advent taking place over Solemnities of Mary, uh, for example, if it falls on a Sunday, it's not celebrated. Um, now, in our country, because it is the Feast of the United States, it is transferred, but does not retain um, all of the, the great pomp and circumstance that it might. So my fear is sometimes, as beautiful and as important a feast is, it oftentimes gets lost. I think that lends to the confusion of, are we talking about Jesus or are we talking about Mary? Because it's so close to his birth. But I think the real gift in those parishes and in all of us looking to that is exactly what you were getting at a little bit ago, is that it's not so much the virgin birth. Um, I remind people I did all the time at Immaculate mm -hmm. Conception and I still do um, when we celebrate this feast, that the importance is that we cannot replicate what Mary physically did all those years ago. But we are no less called to model ourselves after that sense of faithfulness that allows us to give birth to the Word made flesh. Um, we can't physically give birth to Jesus like Mary did, but like Mary, we can take that message into our hearts and then are challenged to share that message with the world. We're gonna talk about another Marian feast in just a moment. Stay with us, we'll be right back. What have you done for your marriage today? I gave my wife a hug this morning. I thought uh, I love her. I uh, did her hair this morning. I think it looks pretty good. <laughs> I cooked my husband's uh, favorite breakfast. I bought her an orchid. What have I done for my marriage today? I sent my husband a love email. I read the newspaper to my wife and it cracked her up. She's, but she's still laughing. <laughs> what have you done for your marriage today? Make a change for the better. Need help? Go to foryourmarriage.org. A message from the Catholic Church. There is a place where a total stranger will give you their blood. There is a place where someone you never knew will save your child from drowning. A place where people from seven states away will turn up at your door and give you food and shelter after a flood. There is a place where a person who doesn't look like you, talk like you, or dress like you will stretch out their hand and put it across your shoulders and say, everything is going to be okay. 
place is called America, where we look out for each other. And it's up to us to keep it that way. When you help the American Red Cross, you help America. Welcome back to Communion of Saints. Uh, we spent our first uh, segment talking about the Immaculate Conception. Now we're going to focus on Our Lady of Guadalupe. Uh, obviously, this, this feast has special significance uh, to um, the, the people of Mexico. And when we talk about that, I think it's, it's, it's important for us to, to call to mind some of those other special feasts of Mary where people were really brought to conversion in faith because of that. Uh, but let's talk um, about some of the specifics of Our Lady of Guadalupe before we get into that discussion. Well, I think certainly with Our Lady of Guadalupe, as you mentioned, um, it is important to the Mexican people, but it has broader ramifications for the church. Um, as we talk a little bit more about some of these other feasts, we'll also see uh, the ways in which individuals have been invited into um, the role of Mary herself. We were mentioning with the Immaculate Conception that we all can play that part of giving birth to that word made flesh. Um, what sometimes people lose sight of is that it's not just this appearance of Our Lady, but it is Our Lady imparting this message to particular individuals, in this case to Juan Diego. Mm -hmm. And then challenging Juan Diego, challenging the children of Fatima, challenging Bernadette Subaru to go out and really to take on that role of Mary by announcing the coming of Christ, by announcing the great challenge to be faithful to God um, and to be devout um, in, our, in our approach of faith, in our approach with one another, in our sense of, of faithfulness. So it really is kind of Mary sharing her role with the world through specific individuals who then go out like Mary and announce the coming of the Lord. You know, when you, you mentioned Juan Diego, and we talked about him in another segment uh, in our series, uh, he was an, an older gentleman who uh, was a devout Catholic, went to daily mass, and uh, it was on his way to mass uh, in, uh, in December uh, in 1531 that he experienced this, this apparition, for lack of a better word. And, um, and so there's this whole sense that, that, as you had mentioned, God calls people of, of all ages, not just mm -hmm. young people, but older people and, and even older people. Mm -hmm. And so there's this whole sense that how we should be disposed of listening to God calling us no matter what age. You know, how often in our own um, pastoral experience do we have uh, some of our more seasoned Catholics say, well, you know, I really can't learn anything more, or there's mm -hmm. nothing more that I need to know. But how important it is for us, whether we're old or young, mm -hmm. to be open and disposed to whatever God has to say to us. And how important it is uh, for our own, not only spiritual growth, but, but for the good of the community as well. Absolutely, and as I mentioned, of course, those stories of the children of Fatima, um, of Bernadette of Lourdes, you know, those are very beautiful stories. And, and I think it, it invites that sense of, of knowledge and imparting knowledge as young people in the church. But I think what Juan Diego and what Our Lady of Guadalupe offers is exactly what you said. Um, this recognition that at every age, at every stage, we are to open ourselves up to this discovery. Um, and how many times people will um, talk to me in the parish, well, you know, I, I got confirmed, you know, or, you know, I went all through grade school. I, I love when 80-year-olds will tell me they went all through grade school. And what I hear in their conversation is, I felt that I could stop learning sure. at age 14. And sometimes I will tell them, you know, if my doctor had an eighth grade diploma on the wall, I'd get another doctor. Mm -hmm. You know, I want my doctor not only to graduate from medical school, but I want him to continue to be part of the medical community that discovers new advancements, mm -hmm. discovers new medicines. And we, I, I use that phrase, the profession of faith, what we say at mass every Sunday. Mm -hmm. it, there's a twofold there. Yes, we are professing something, but it reminds us that our profession, our occupation is to continue to be these disciples and we can't stop the learning process. Mm -hmm. Like Juan Diego, we have to be open to those miraculous messages at every stage. If Juan Diego would have said, eh, and threw those roses away because I'm way past 14, I've learned enough, where would we be? 
Mm -hmm. You're absolutely right. And I think when we talk about that is, as Catholics, there's that whole sense of, of discipleship. Discipleship is not something that, that happens once and that's it. It's mm -hmm. ongoing. It's, it's mm -hmm. almost like uh, the Christian life, like, like stewardship, like any tenets of our faith, it's ongoing. It's, it's, it's something that we continue to, to understand and to learn. And, and that is true about, about all of these feasts that we celebrate. You know, they, they obviously occurred historically in a time and a place, but yet we're, we're learning more about that. And as people of faith, that's really important for us to do that because what's worse is to get sedentary in our faith. It's almost like um, sitting there uh, with the television remote, mm -hmm. the, the typical couch potato. That's not how we should be in our own faith. Mm -hmm. You know, we need to grow, we need to learn, we need to be formed uh, in those doctrines. Let's talk about some of the specifics about um, Our Lady of Guadalupe. We know that Pope uh, Leo XIII uh, designated that feast, um, celebrating it, um, declaring it in February of 1887, but the feast we celebrate is actually on December 12th. Mm -hmm. And as we mentioned um, about the Immaculate Conception, it falls within the Advent season, mm -hmm. and so does Our Lady of Guadalupe. Mm -hmm. And what does that say for us as Catholics celebrating Advent prior to Christmas? Well, I think in as much as there can be that obstacle of we're already gearing up towards Christmas and so, oh, let's get this feast over, let's get that feast over. I think it does play very well with the Advent season of that preparation, of that making ready. Mm -hmm. And um, I think by no accident, the apparition in Mexico to a, an impoverished um, older gentleman to an impoverished nation, um, more or less. Um, what I'd like to mention also is factoring that in with Leo the Thirteenth. Mm -hmm. You know what we see in Leo the Thirteenth is um, this is the man who really gave us the gateway to what we see as our Catholic social teaching with Rerum Novarum, and much of that document and much of all of the documents of social teaching since then have been focused on how to lift up people, mm -hmm. and I think even in this naming. Um, the Feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe as an official recognized apparition. Some are not officially recognized. Um, Leo the Thirteenth is saying we are lifting up this model. We are lifting up this presence of Mary um, to show people that they are not abandoned. They are not left by the wayside. They are to be cooperators in this sense of mercy and peace, this message of Christ coming. And so we must all prepare ourselves, but that preparation, again, isn't just to myself, it has to be outward toward others. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, in closing in this segment, we want to uh, remind ourselves again about the millions of, of, of Mexicans who were converted to the faith mm -hmm. and who grew in their faith because of this celebration of Our Lady of Guadalupe, because of uh, Juan Diego's um, faith, because mm -hmm. of his, um, vision of the Blessed Mother, but also more importantly, of his sharing that with others. Mm -hmm. And that's really part of it too. You know, we, we, we get things from the Lord, we hear things, we celebrate things, but it's important to share those with others. That's ultimately what discipleship is all about. Absolutely. We're gonna take a break and continue our uh, show in just a moment. Please stay with us. I am Marino. Je suis Marino. I am Marinol. I believe that we are all connected to each other, and that it is the gift of compassion that unites us and makes us one. It doesn't matter what language, culture, or tradition we come from. We can share compassion wherever we are. Marinol, an American Catholic organization of priests and brothers, has been reaching out to those in need for nearly 100 years in 26 countries throughout the world. Marinol dedicates 86 cents of every dollar donated to their programs, and with your help, they can do more. Missionaries, workers, volunteers, supporters, we are all Marinol. I am Marinol. Yo soy Marinol. I'm Father Mike, and I am Marinol. 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 Johnsons enjoy Friday dinners out, nothing fancy, just time together to reconnect as family. They make sure others eat as well. 
By giving to Catholic Charities of Youngstown, the Johnsons join other angels who care for those in need, regardless of religion or race. Show your wings with a gift to Catholic Charities, changing lives one family at a time, providing housing, emergency financial assistance, senior services, and more. Give now at ccdoy.org. Welcome back to our show. Now we're going to talk about another special feast of the Blessed Mother, and that's the Feast of the Assumption of Mary. You know, when we talk about the word assumption, it's probably good for us to define that. For example, um, our Orthodox brothers and sisters use the word dormition, mm -hmm. uh, which basically has its root in saying that, that Mary was sleeping. And so it's interesting when we talk about the feast of the Assumption of Mary, that we don't get all caught up with the question, well, did she die or didn't she die? Because even in the doctrine itself, um, the Pope left that open. Absolutely. Uh, when, when Pius XII uh, promulgates this in 1950, I believe the language that he uses is when Mary's earthly life had come to an end or had finished. And so um, he purposely, I believe, left it open uh, to debate or to discussion, or maybe he purposely just felt this was not something to be debated. Mm -hmm. um, it really doesn't matter. Um, you know, we don't want all kinds of people writing in, but it doesn't matter whether Mary died or fell asleep. The real miracle for Mary and for us was that she lived a life without sin. Mm -hmm. She lived a life of, again, as we mentioned at the beginning of this uh, segment, um, or at the beginning of the show, of free will. Mm -hmm. She continued to choose even after Gabriel, even after the birth of Christ, even after Joseph dies. Every step of the way in her life, she continues to choose to be faithful to God. And that reward of a completely faithful life is that presence in heaven, being assumed body and soul into heaven. And so no, Pius XII leaves it open for debate. Um, and it really doesn't have that ramification. If we debate whether she died or didn't die, we lose the point. The point is how do we strive to live the best lives we can so that we might join her one day? in that kingdom of heaven. You know, it's interesting when we were talking about um, Mary's Immaculate Conception and Our Lady of Guadalupe and, and some of the other feasts of Mary, and it was mentioned that, that there's oftentimes no scriptural reference to that. Mm -hmm. uh, when we talk about the Assumption of Mary, there are some scriptural references. For mm -hmm. example, uh, in Paul's uh, first letter to the Corinthians, he talks about, um, O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your grave? So there's that whole sense that, that um, in Mary's assumption that that is all caught up in God's love mm -hmm. and eternal presence. And so uh, there's that whole castigation of the grave and of death mm -hmm. in Mary's assumption. The other is in uh, the last book of the Bible, in the book of Revelation, chapter 12, where um, St. John in his writings talks about the woman clothed with the sun and who uh, issues forth uh, the Redeemer and then is brought into the desert where a special place has been set aside for her by God. So there's that whole sense that, that in this image of, of John's words in Revelation, that God had predestined a place for her that was special in his, in his eyes mm -hmm. and also in, in human history. So there's that whole sense that while we cannot pinpoint something in scripture, we can use those, those uh, lessons in sacred scripture to help better understand humanly uh, what God had prepared, especially for the Blessed Mother. I think one of the other things that, that the assumption allows us to see is that complete love of God. Mm -hmm. um, and by that I mean Mary was never abandoned. Mm -hmm. um, we see from the Immaculate Conception through the Assumption of the Blessed Virgin Mary, this complete care um, that God offers her mm -hmm. um, in allowing her to be born without original sin or personal sin, her cooperation with his gift of free will, her devotion and love, her reception of Christ, her giving birth and caring for him as a mother. But then even after her son suffers and dies on the cross, Mary is not then left. She's not abandoned. God mm -hmm. doesn't forget about her because she served her purpose, but now my son has returned to me. Mary's on her own. It does show this complete 
love of God for us, for disciples, that he never abandons us. And I think that's something that we recognize then in this, this total life of Mary from her immaculate conception through her assumption into heaven. She was never abandoned. And we too are never mm -hmm. abandoned by God. But again, we need to continue to pattern ourselves after Mary's selfless giving. And when we talk about uh, the Blessed Mother, it's probably good for us to uh, look at uh, human history and salvation history. We, we believe that, that Jesus was the new Adam. Mm -hmm. And so Mary is the new Eve. Um, and, and that doesn't say uh, in Mary's life that she was free from uh, human frailty or peril. Uh, she probably got colds. She eventually mm -hmm. died. You know, there's that whole sense that, that as humans, you know, we, we, are, we are caught up in, in our human frailty, and yet there's that spark of divine that's within us as well. And so in Jesus, as the new Adam, who brings about a new creation mm -hmm. through Mary, brings about this whole new discipleship, this whole new sense that, that we too are caught up in God's love. And we too are predestined for something greater and ultimately resurrection of our, our body and eternal life in heaven. So there's that whole sense that, that in, in, uh, in Jesus and in Mary, the new Adam, the new Eve, and so in us, there's this new sense of, of newness of life that ultimately is arising. Absolutely, I, I'm struck when you're talking about discipleship um, the words in baptism, the instruction to parents, mm -hmm. that they are the first and best um, teachers of their children in the ways of the faith. And we look at Mary, not only Christ's mother, but our mother, and we give her kind of the same terminology, the first and the best or greatest disciple mm -hmm. um, who continues to illuminate the path, who continues to um, challenge us in our discipleship. And so we do look to Mary um, at every step of the way. And, and as you said, certainly there were challenges that came into Mary's life. And she was constantly, again, not to harp on free will, but she was constantly given opportunities where she could have rejected God, where she could have given in to despair or anguish or frustration. Um, scripture doesn't record that St. Joseph dies, but we know he did. He's there when they find Jesus in the temple. He's not there when Jesus is crucified. Mm -hmm. If he was still alive, he would be comforting his wife. Mm -hmm. So she experiences the loss of a husband. Then when she experiences the loss of her son, it's not just this automatically, our savior has died, mm -hmm. but she's a woman in first century Jerusalem without any male adult. Mm -hmm. She should be concerned for herself, but she's constantly concerned for others. She's constantly worried about um, her faithfulness, but their faithfulness as well. And then she becomes the example for the apostles. Now as Catholics, we celebrate this Feast of the Assumption on August 15th. And like all of the Feasts of the Blessed Mother, we celebrate those. We do not worship Mary, we venerate her as the Mother of God and the Mother of the Church. Thank you for being with us. Have a good day and God be with you. The Communion of Saints was a production of CTNY, the Catholic Television Network of Youngstown. Your program hosts were Father Jim Corda and Father Jack Lavelle.